going to say recording. Oh, that is recording. Never mind. Okay. All right. Thank you to Heavenly Father in Heaven for this opportunity to once again come at this, just past this midweek point to study the word together and to study this amazing theme that you have for us in Romans 4. Something that we don't completely understood, uh, understand. I myself have not understood it for quite some time. And Lord, thank you so much for revealing uh, to me this understanding of your word and to share it freely with my brothers and sisters. And I pray, Lord, that you will deny us of ourselves, that we will put self away and we'll allow the spirit of Christ to possess us and to give us clarity through the word, through spirit of prophecy as well, and to really grow together as, uh, as one body in Christ. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for your promises in your word and thank you that you stick to that word and make things real for us. Lord, we love you and we thank you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay. So it's, I thought I'd share that in light of today's theme, because today's theme is very, uh, well, the testimony is very relative as to the theme of discussion today. And the theme today is, or in Romans 4, is what is works? What is labor? Um, in the spiritual sense and in the physical sense, and when it refers to works in the word of God, what does he mean by works? Because I think there is a lot of confusion within the nominal Adventist faith, within uh, the Father-Son movement, within Christendom as a whole, as to what works really represents. So what I'm going to do is I'm just, before we get into the word, we're going to read from, I'm just going to share a screen here. We're going to read from sketches from the life of Paul. So we can understand what his life was like at that time um, with regards to the subject. And it's very, it's actually quite beautifully accurate as to what it is we have to understand here. All right. So I'm just going to move that to one side. Can you see that? Can you, can you guys see the, the yeah. chapter? All right. Fantastic. All right. So I'm just going to read that. Well, and then fun, sorry. No, no problem. All right. So that is chapter 26. Sojourn at Rome. And we're going to read maybe two pages. Um, we'll go on to the Lord says stop. All right. Okay. So let's continue on. It says, yeah, because I'm just going to read. I've got the book, yeah, obviously in my hand. And I'm kind of have this thing about still picking up the book and reading, like reading it twice. That's, that's the point. Anyway, so I'm going to read with the screen as well. It says, yeah, according to Roman law, the trial of Paul could not take place until his accusers should be present in person to state their charges against him. They had not yet come from Palestine, nor was it known at Rome whether they had even started on the long journey. Therefore, the trial might be postponed indefinitely. Little of a guard was shown for the rights of those supposed to have violated the law. It was often the case that an accused person was kept in prison a long time by the delay of the prosecutors to prefer their charge to prefer their charges or his trial might be deferred by the capri by the caprice of those in power a corrupt judge could hold a prisoner in custody for years as did felix in the case of paul to gratify popular prejudice or in hope of securing a bribe these judges were some while well, were, however, uh, sorry, skip my there. Amiable. Oh, sorry, amiable. Yes, I'm sorry, mom. I skipped past that. Okay, however, amiable to a higher to a higher tribunal, and this would, in some measure, serve as a restraint upon them. But the emperor was subjected to no such restraint. His authority was virtually unlimited, and he often permitted caprice, malice, or even indolence to hinder or prevent the administration mm. of justice. And this is often the case, obviously, that we see within those that are put in a position within a denomination. They think it's okay for them to be acting in such a way because they've been given the power to do so. It's an abuse of power. Really. Power corrupts. Yes, and absolute power corrupts, absolutely. Mm -hmm. The Jews of Jerusalem were in no haste to present their accusations against Paul. 
They had been repeatedly thwarted in their designs and had no desire to risk another defeat. Lysias, Felix, Felix, Festus, and Agrippa had all declared their belief in his innocence. His enemies could hope for success only in seeking by intrigue to influence the emperor in their favor. Delay would further their object, as it would afford them time to perfect and execute their plans. In the providence of God, all this delay resulted in the furtherance of the gospel. <laughs> Praise the Lord for that. Paul was not condemned to a life of inactivity. He was allowed free intercourse with his friends and was permitted to dwell in a, commo in a commodious house where he daily presented the truth to those who flocked to listen to his words. Thus, for years, he continued preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. And his labors, notice this word, and his labors were not confined to the preaching of the gospel. The care of all the churches still rested upon him. He deeply felt the danger that threatened those for whom he had labored so earnestly. And he sought as, as far as possible to supply by written communications the place of his personal instruction. I'm going to hold it just there for a moment. It's talking about labors here. And it's talking about work in this sense. But clearly it's giving a picture here that the labor he has is of a spiritual nature. Mm. It is not of a physical self-seeking nature. Well, first of all, he couldn't actually do it because he was, was in custody, house arrest, right? Yeah. Under house arrest, yes. Mm. But even prior to that, every position that he was given since the day that Christ met him on Galilee Road was really to conform his life from living one of self and for his own preservation and moving towards a different kind of labor, a different kind of work. And I think this is the kind of work that Christ is meaning when he says, go make disciples. It's of a spiritual nature, mm -hmm. not a physical one. Mm -hmm. Although physical, we do know that physical labors can lead us to share the gospel. And I think that is the point of it. We have our physical labors if God indeed puts us there in order to share the truth with others, not for own self-preservation as the world might think it or may have us think. All right, it goes on. It says, let me just scroll down a bit here. All right, we are reading from here. He also sent out authorized delegates to labor among the churches he had praised, we had raised up and also in fields which he had not visited. These messengers rendered him faithful service, and being in communication with him, he was informed concerning the condition and dangers of the churches and was enabled to exercise a constant supervision over them. And this is the way, this is when you see those parts in, this, in his books where he says, I cannot come unto you now. Yeah. He's ref this is him writing when he That's was right. under house arrest. They were letters. So there were letters written from him and used used messengers to go and share it out. Probably like Ella White in her time, because she wrote lots of letters, messages to the churches. You know? Amen. It's also what God is calling all of us to do right now. Mm. This is this is why we had the the previous study was on the on the latter rain, because we have to have that early rain experience to share the gospel with us, to go out and proclaim this good news. And the spirit of prophecy to those that have never heard it before. This is the labor that Christ expects of us. But let's move on. It says here. Um, Thus, while apparently cut off from active labor, mm. Paul exerted a wider and more lasting influence than he could have exerted had he been free to travel among the churches as in former years. As a prisoner of the Lord, he had a firmer hold upon the affections of his brethren in the faith. Hmm. And his words commanded even greater attention and respect than when he was personally with them. When they first learned that their beloved teacher had been made a prisoner. Sorry. If I may say something. Yes, go for it. Isn't that sort of like we're living in a kind of like a type because of this whole lockdown thing? We also in this like um, prison in a sense mm. and I mean especially other countries like Great Britain they're all in lockdown and who are our messengers 
the programs and the apps. Oh, this is how we do it today. It's like <laughs> we can communicate. These are our letters. There we know? go. There we go. It says, and they mourned and would not be comforted. Not until he was removed from them did they realize how heavy were the burdens which he had borne in their behalf. Heretofore, they had largely excused themselves from responsibility and burden bearing because they lacked his wisdom, tact, and indomitable energy. And now, left in their inexperience to learn the lessons they had shunned and feeling that they were never more to be benefited by the apostles' labors. They prized the warning, counsel, and instruction which he sent them, as they had never before prized his teachings. Now that that's a gut punch to us today because we've been given we've been given these truths for so long and we have held back. You guys will know this by now. I say things boldly and directly because this is how he spoke, and this is the encouragement he gives us. We have, and I'm speaking for myself now more than anything. I have lacked as an individual, even the things that God has given me to take it at his word and to move forward with it. And this is what we have seen now. This is why we have so many meetings and so many of these discussions are centered around the, the issue of the Laodicean state as Bradley has been, he's putting together a beautiful study on the Philadelphia and the Laodicean state. Mm -hmm. And we have allowed ourselves to become Laodiceans because we have been given something and done nothing with it or very or done very little with it. Mm. And this is the same experience that is being expressed with these that followed after Paul's uh, teachings. But let's, let's leave it for that. Let's leave it there for a moment. I will continue this again. It says, and over here, and as they learned of his courage, faith, and meekness in his long imprisonment, they also were stimulated to greater fidelity and zeal in the cause of Christ. Mm -hmm. This is an encouragement to us. This is something mm -hmm. that we need to take at heart and actually do. We need to do it. Mm -hmm. Saying it, just keeping as a head knowledge is not going to help us. We need to actually do it. And the Lord has given us an opportunity in wherever we are to do it. Yeah. We don't need to rely on our strength. If we say to ourselves, I can't do it, I'm too shy, or too, we are just excusing ourselves from doing it. We have the Almighty God. We have the Lord Jesus Christ, to which all things are attained in victory. He has promised to give it to us if we trust Him. Mm. All right. I'm just going to read a few more and then we can get straight into the word. Have you got something you want to share there? Yeah, I just want to read 1 Peter. 3 verses 18 and 19 it says for Christ also has once suffered for sins the just for the unjust that he might bring us to God hmm. being put to death in in the flesh but quickened by the spirit by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison amen so so symbolically Symbolically, literally, could be literal prisoners, but yeah. it could also be symbolic of right. those that are spiritually in prison. Yeah. But I mean, he was uh, he was counseling the counsel of Paul was the spirit of Christ, as much as Paul was the counsel to the church. The spirit of Christ was counseling him on a daily basis. This is the example he's given us. Yeah, and throughout Scripture, especially in the New Testament, this is this is the account that has been given. So if it's repeated, then clearly it's significant. Mm. All right, it goes on. It says, thank you, brother. Yeah. It says, among the assistants of Paul in his labors were many of his former companions and fellow workers. Luke, the beloved physician, who had attended him in the journey to Jerusalem, the two years' imprisonment at Caesarea, and upon his last perilous voyage, was with him still. Timothy also ministered to his comfort. Mm -hmm. Tychicus was his mail bearer, taking his messengers the messages to the different churches which they had visited together. Damas and Mark also were with him. Mark had once been refused by Paul as unworthy to accompany him because mm. when his help was, was much needed, he had left the apostle and returned to his home. Mm. He saw that as Paul's companion, his life must be one of constant toil, mm. anxiety, and self-denial. And he desired an easier path. This led the apostle to feel that he could not be trusted. And that decision caused the unhappy dissension between Paul 
Barnabas. Mm -hmm. Now that's some interesting insight. But notice what he says here. He says his life must be one of constant toil, anxiety, and self-denial, and he desired an easier path. Now, Christ says his yoke is easy, his mm -hmm. burden light. Mm -hmm. And this, this scripture is going to be reflected in Romans 4 when we read. And this have you have to ask yourself the question, and this is the question I ask daily. If we are working for ourselves, and please don't misunderstand, this is not to say that we are not to do something or to be lazy and just sit around and wait God for God to do it, not at all. But all what we are doing, being part of the systems that be, holding a daily job and trying to sustain our debts, trying to get ourselves uh, moving forward or moving out into the country, forgetting the, those left behind and just to share the love of Christ with them. Is this the kind of work God actually accepts? Is this, is this something that we can bring to the table and say, no, the Lord has put me in this position. This is where I need to be. Is it truly the position that he's put us in? Not that I'm questioning anyone's integrity or their own uh, understanding or personal work with the Lord, not at all. But it helps us to understand in a very closer and deeper scope of things what God accepts as his labor and what we bring to the table and say, this is what God has given me as labor. Truly, he must accept it. Mm. That's the difference. Anyway, let's go, just to put this as just to put this in the back of the mind as we read through this, just the next, I'm going to read maybe the next two paragraphs and then we're going to go straight into Romans 4. It says, Mark had since learned the lesson which all must learn that God's claims are above every other. <clears throat> See the relation already of what I just mentioned. He saw that there is no release in the Christian warfare. Mm. This is something I mentioned last time. If we expect if we expect our life to be easy or expect our life to be without turmoil or without stress and without persecution, you're on the wrong path then. That's right. This is a very hard life. This is going to be persecution day in and day out until the day the Lord returns. And it's only going to get worse. And if you're not, if you're not being persecuted, then you know you're with the devil. You're on the wrong side. Yeah. You're on the wrong side. Yeah. We're happy are those that are persecuted for the name for the name of the Lord. Yeah. I'm paraphrasing, but you know, you know that yeah. scripture. Okay. It says here, he had obtained a closer and more perfect view of his pattern and had seen upon his hands the scars of his conflict to save the lost and perishing. Mm -hmm. He was willing to follow his master's example of earnestness and self sacrifice mm. that he might win souls to jesus and the blessedness of heaven sounds already now that he's putting his entire life on the line into mm. christ's hands in order to do that which christ expects of him to do mm. Amen. and this is the call that we have been called to do and that's why the hundred and forty four thousand will be so few and now while sharing the lot of paul the prisoner mark understood better than ever before that it is infinite infinite gain to win christ at whatever cost an infinite loss to win the world and lose the soul for whose redemption the blood of christ was shed Doof. <laughs> gut punch that's how i feel reading this it, it gives me a no it does it gives me a gut punch it makes me makes me realize this is where i failed for so long mm. and if any time during the week and i do make this mistake yeah. still sometimes it helps me to realize that I'm not all there, uh, but the Lord is, by God's grace alone, he's bringing me to this understanding. I mean, just, um, okay, I see he's muted. That's fantastic. All right. So it's given us a very clear picture here, yeah. but let's read on. It says, yeah, um, Mark was now a useful, useful and beloved helper of the apostle. And he continued faithful even unto the end in writing from Rome just prior to his martyrdom. Paul bade Timothy. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. Mm. So you see, it's already given us a contrast here, how Mark was unprofitable for the work, and even according to Paul, because he had put his home, his life, above God's work. And this has given us a very powerful understanding of what God expects of us. What makes us think 
that if we put our entire lives, our homes, our family, our job, our everything into God's hand and say, you know what, Lord, I'm not going to do it for myself anymore. I want to do your work. And I know that you will help me pay the bills. I'll, I know that you will help me get rid of my debt or whatever mm -hmm. it might be and help me to move out when the time is right according to your will and timing. What makes us think that God can't do that? I'll tell you what it is. We have been so brainwashed into the way that society has been structured that we think that the way that society is structured must be withheld, must be held to, and we must serve God in his way of understanding in the word. It cannot be both. That's why it says we cannot serve God mm -hmm. and mammon. Mammon is God of self. If you summarize the entire meaning, it's really what it comes down to. And everything in this world dictates mm. self needs right. to get something. Self right. must self be exalted. Self-awareness, self-provision, self, self, self mm. anything, mm. right? Self, self, self. Anything with the word self, mm. besides the word self-denial, okay? <laughs> then we know that we're not on the right path. And it's why we as Adventists have struggled for so long. I'm saying now because I was born as a third generation Adventist. My grandmother became an Adventist. My mother was, grew, grew up as Adventist and I grew up as an Adventist. Right, but I still didn't understand this because why? I was in constant war spiritually without knowing it that the life that Christ had for me was radical. He expected me to deny this life on every level in order to attain something better in Him. Mm -hmm. And He promises, like in Matthew 6, look at the birds, they toil not, neither do they spin. Right. Yeah. Yet look at them, they are provided better than even. Or he refers to the lilies, he's referring to Solomon. Sure. Solomon was wise. Solomon had a kingdom. Solomon had a lot. But it is God that put him in that position. It is mm. God that provided him to have it. And just as much as God can give it is as much as God can take away. Mm. And this is the thing. We need to bring into our understanding daily that Christ is the one that has been given all power and authority and judgment over our lives every day. Yeah. And if we don't conform to his will and just want to conform to what we think is right, we're going to lose out on a bigger lesson. We're going to lose out on even salvation if we're not careful. And this is what it's described. This is what it's already describing. And this is why Romans 4 is such a very important part of the Bible to understand. But anyway, I'm going to read the last. I'm going to read the very next um, paragraph and then we're going to go jump jump straight into it it says yeah damas was now a faithful helper of the apostle a few years afterward so you might excuse me going up a few years afterward however in the same letter to timothy which commends mark's fidelity paul writes damas hath forsaken me having loved this present world mm. you see the relation here it's very clear cut the language is straightly employed for worldly gain Damas bartered every higher and nobler consideration. How short-sighted, how unwise the exchange. Those who profess only worldly wealth or honor are poor indeed, however much they may proudly call their own. Those who choose to suffer for Christ's sake will win eternal riches. They will be heirs of God and joint heirs with his son. Mm -hmm. They may not, they may not have on earth a place to lay their heads, but in heaven, the savior whom they love is preparing mansions for them. Mm -hmm. Many in their pride and ignorance forget that lowly things are mighty. In order to be happy, we must learn self-denial mm -hmm. at the foot of the cross. Mm -hmm. We want no earthly hope so firmly root rooted that we cannot transplant it to paradise. I want to leave it at that for now. And we can pick this up again uh, next week with the next lesson. Mm. But this gives us a very direct gut punch that tells us, brothers and sisters, the Lord has a way. And we need to conform our entire lives to that way. Mm -hmm. Whether it's in thought, in word, in deed, in lifestyle, everything, our entire existence needs to be conformed to the will of God, not mm -hmm. our own. And trust me, it is a hard thing for me even. And um, it's not an easy walk. But you know what? 
It is a graceful walk. It is a humility that we all need and helps us respect God for the respect that is due to him. Mm. Mm. All right. So let's go into Romans chapter four. I'm going to bring two other scriptures in now as we go with regards to what it is we've read. So I'm going to just um, stop sharing here for a moment. Ah, there we go. Okay. So let's continue. Romans chapter four. Now I see why I see why Abraham is is brought up in this scripture because it's on this topic. And really it's I like this Bible first of all because the way that they've categorized each section of the scripture is beautiful. The first section is Abraham's righteousness apart from works. Mm. What works is that? Obviously physical laboring works. Mm. Right, right Abraham's righteousness apart from circumcision. Mm. Right prior to Christ even coming and establishing what circumcision represents the circumcision of the heart abraham's righteousness apart from the law meaning something that is based on faith we're going to get to that abraham's righteousness was by faith claiming it for sure mm. so that's just how it's been compiled man's lives in this bible so mm. that's, why, that's why i read it but anyway um what's very interesting here is abraham was what he was a sojourner mm. he was a traveler he, he was given instruction by God to go, yeah, to go mm -hmm. there, to establish this, to establish that. Yeah. Yes, he had his things in his life. He could have sheep and goats and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. But these things were second rate compared to what God's instruction was. Mm -hmm. And this is the relevance of what we're going to study here. Okay, so it says, verse 4. Let's just open quickly with another word of prayer. Lord, as you go through your word of God, as you go through the word of God right now, I pray that you will help us indeed to deny ourselves and our own understanding of the scripture and help us to understand the words that are employed in the scripture and help us to take it to heart and to add to our lives and to deny our current lives and to grow in the strength and in the faith of Jesus Christ. Lord, we love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. What shall we say then that Abraham, our father, has pertaining to the flesh, hath found. Very interesting question. What has he found in his relationship with things regarding to the flesh, things of this world, things that relate to everyday life? Mm. For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. Mm -hmm. Notice it says, but not before God. So the word works is here. And the word before God, not before God. So just to make it easy, I must get the others. But I have done the, the difference between Strong's and the others. They do say okay. the same thing. Yeah, yeah. So I'm just going to, I'm going to just highlight the word works here in the concordance. Okay. Just to help us understand what the word works really means. Because um, I have had this discussion with theologians <laughs> or those of, the theological understanding of the things, educated ones. the educated ones. <laughs> and they say to me that it is works is a very misunderstood word. Indeed it is. So is your ergon, a primary, but absolute word to work, to toil as an effort or occupation by implication and act a deed doing labor work. So work deed doing labor. So works is talking about labor. So when he's saying in the context here, what if Abraham were justified by works? So labors, physical labors, right? He's talking about physical labors here. He hath whereof to glory. His glory is what? But not before God. So it's not something that God is necessarily saying, this is my work. But it's only by God when he gives an instruction, which is of a spiritual work, spiritual nature. Just like Christ said, I go about doing my father's work That's which right. is what of a spiritual nature not mm. of a physical laboring constantly mm. Mm. but it makes it clearer let's go on verse three for what saith the scripture abraham believed god and it was counted unto him for righteousness mm. where does belief have anything to do with physical labor mm. where is the connection but you're comparing something internal or heartfelt matter or mind felt matter mm. than to something that is just perceived on a physical level. Yeah. It's two separate things. 
So it's belief. clearly telling us here. Belief is not something you physically do. It's not it's something, something, it's that something comes from internal. Yes. Okay. So it's given us a very strong contrast here. All right. So, sorry, verse. All right. So it's referring to for, it's quoting uh, believed God and he was encountered unto him for righteousness. This is Genesis 15, verse 6. So it's quoting Old Testament here. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. Wow. Okay, so what is it saying here? So now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, mm. but of debt. Now look at the society. Look at the way that we work in today's society. Mm. When we do physical labors, are we without debt? We're always in debt. We're always in debt, either to the bank or to the boss or, something. or to someone you owed money from or in some way or another, you don't get reprieve. There is no... There's no time of less stress. There is always what, more stress. What about, debt, what about your debt of time? Debt of time. You have to pay your time to your boss. There we go. You can't just knock off any time you want to. You, you, you finish at five o'clock. You can't. Because I, I feel like finishing at three o'clock. Right. You've got a debt to time. So it's a very physical yeah. um, a very physical thing that's represented here. And it is not reckoned of grace. Grace is what? God's power to mm. perform. God's power to make it real. So it's saying that this kind of work that we have is not something that God reckons by his power, but it is under debt. It is expected of us on a human level. Mm. There's nothing to do with God. And grace is a gift. Grace is a gift. We're going to get to that Sorry. scripture in a moment. No, 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 no. no, carry on. It says here, verse five, but to him that worketh not, notice this, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So what is it telling us here? It's saying those that don't work physical labor. Okay. It's, it's excluding physical labors here. It's not saying that God is approving anything of your physical labor, labor and saying, this is the standard I have for you. If you look at Adam and Eve prior to their fall, was their physical tasking or their physical labor something that they had to do to prove to God? No. Everything they had was a gift. They were given it. It wasn't a physical toiling blood, sweat, and tears to name the animals mm. or to tend the garden. That came afterwards. Plus, they yeah, had the immortality of God because they ate of the tree of life. Mm. So they didn't, they didn't have that same kind of laboring experience. Mm. Not at all. Mm. But let's, 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 let's continue how it says here. Verse 6. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of man, Unto, who, unto whom God imputeth righteousness, wait for it, without works, yeah. without works. So God is saying, it's saying David already understood that God can impute righteousness unto a person, even if that person is not committed to physical labor. Mm -hmm. That's what it's saying here. And to make it clear, it's quoting David's very words, verses 7 and verses 8. Mm. And this is coming from Psalm 32, 1 and 2. It says, yes, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Why? Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Why would David say such a thing? Why would he say that? Because the burden of this world, the burden of doing physical labor brings us under debt in some way or another. And as Brad says, debt of time. Our time is supposed to be spent with, with, the, Lord. with the Lord. Okay. Mm. And we are so clouded. We are so busy mm. with our lives. How much time do we really spend with the Lord? Yeah. As in how much time does God actually expect us to spend with him? To the relation of how much time we choose to spend with him shouldn't we want to spend all the time with him not just some of the time with him or when it's convenient or when it doesn't jeopardize our jobs or jeopardize our relationships with people isn't god supposed to be first above all mm. so keeping that in mind the next thing when it says blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered blessed is the man to whom will not impute sin He's saying that he, blessed is the man who God does not expect him to do physical labor in order to please God. Mm -hmm. 
We don't need to do anything in our physical construct to please God. It is a response to his instruction. Yeah. Yes. I just want to say that it's in comparison to Cain and Abel. Cain offered his works. Look what I've done. Look at my beautiful fruit. Look at my labor. Look what I'm offering you. Abel gave his, his first fruit, his gift. He, he, it wasn't something that he worked for. It was something that he offered to the Lord. It was an offering that he gave to him. It is. But this also has to do with obedience. Yeah. Because Abel followed the instruction of God. Right. Yeah. He, God said, this is what I expect of you. Mm. This is the work I'm giving you to do. Mm. He said, yes, Lord, I will take what you tell me to do mm. and do that work. Yeah. Whereas Cain disobeyed this God's instruction. This is what I want to do. This is what I think. And I believe God's going to recognize mm. what I think is my work. Yet he did not put a credit to the water, the soil, you the see? seed that you was see? given to him by the Lord. Exactly. Yeah. And you can say the, the way that the world has been going, the way that we've been going for so long, we're like Cain because we're doing what our works, we're doing what we think is right. Yeah. And then covering our own understanding and saying, this is what God expects of me. Mm. How do we know that for sure? Yeah. Is this something that God has literally told us to do? Or is this something that we think we can do or must do, and then God's just going to approve of it? And Ella White said um, that uh, with the church, it's like our religion will be changed and books of a new order. She says they will go out and do great works. They will do amazing stuff. But what works are they doing? Look how big our church is. Look how beautiful our church is. Look right. how much money our church has made. So Look it's by members. physical efforts and then ascertaining that those physical results and saying, oh, this is God blessing us. Yeah. That's not what that means at all. Yeah. And this is the same thing when he took Peter, the fisherman, and he said, I will make you a fisher of men. Mm. He was talking about discipling work. He was talking about spiritual labor, mm. not physical labor. Same as Moses. I'll make you a shepherd of men. He was under the rule. He was a prince. He was an Egyptian prince. Mm. And he did physical labors mm. in honor to who? The king of the land, which was Pharaoh. Mm. Okay. But that's not what God had prepared him to do. 40 years he experienced that. He had to undo that for another 40 years to be a shepherd. Mm. And what did he have to do? Attend sheep. Mm. Mm. In order to bring people out of Israel. Mm. So this is... God this, teaching him an object lesson. So this is... This is... What, what were you trying to say? Did, well, did you say what you were going to say? With what, Sister Lizette? What was I trying to say? With what Moses? Oh, you were just talking about the church. Oh, the church of, well, I mean, as what it says about the church of Laodicea, you have increased in wealth, um, though you think you're rich, but you are poor, wretched, and blind. So the church itself thinks that it's, I mean, we have these beautiful churches to it, 25 million members, so many people being baptized, and we think that that is an accomplishment, but yet we, we met someone that was baptized of the church, for example, and he didn't even know anything about inner light or the Sabbath or, or things like that. So the church has increased in wealth, but yet it's still naked, poor and blind. So because it doesn't, it doesn't understand it. We don't, we're not taking our instructions directly from on high. Yeah. We're taking instructions from the word of God that will suit us. Mm. That's yeah. what it is. A mm. gut punch. It's yeah. the way it is. It's just the way it is. All right. Verse 9. Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only? So upon those that uh, have started a new life in Christ, that have given their lives totally in surrender, or upon the uncircumcision also? For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. Mm. So it's giving us a good two parallel question. And in saying it was reckoned unto Abraham for righteousness. By what standard? Faith. Faith is taking God at his word. Grace is his power to fulfill it. If you were to summarize these two expressions. Now it says, verse 10. How was it then reckoned? How? When he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? He was long before Christ. He knew that there was supposed to be a promise coming. He knew that Christ, while everything of the promise made, was for Christ to come. Mm. 
So it was before seed. circumcision was made a reality. Mm. Okay. From a seed. It's not for, he was the first father of that seed, right? Mm. He says, I will make unto you many gen, many nations. Mm. And that, that scripture does come in, no, no. But it says here, how was it then reckoned when he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. Mm. So it's telling us already that when God says something, it is. Whether you're circumcised or not, by faith, are ye saved? Mm. Right? It is by faith, taking God in his word. We are saved by grace through faith. That's right. It is by having that relationship with God, by taking him in his word daily and he asking him, Lord, what do you expect of me this day? Yeah. That is taking God on faith. That is the kind of understanding that we need to have. And when he gives us an instruction to God, make disciples, who are we to say, no, I'd rather be a mechanical engineer. I'd rather be a chef. I'm saying it straight. This is exactly what the world has a problem with. And it's why the layered, why I've fallen into a Laodicean state. That's why we fall into the Laodicean. We try to have best of both worlds. We can't. That's not what Christ is saying. That's not what the scripture says. And it's certainly not what Abraham believed. But let's go on. Let's go on. Well, if I may say, yes. if circumcision is uh, like it was a covenant that Abraham made, but it's a physical thing, the mm. circumcision. It's an outward expression of keeping the covenant. Of course. So when we start to read that, um, you know, in like Hebrews, I think it's in 7 or 8, and uh, Jeremiah 31, we have a new covenant, a covenant of the heart. That's right. So this is an inward change, an inward experience, not an outward thing. You know, like the old days, they used to write the laws on their, on their sleeves and have the tassels to show the law. But... But an outward expression without actually living in that. Yeah, like, look at me, I'm keeping the law, but, you know, the law should be in your heart. Amen. Verse 11. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, mm. which he had yet been uncircumcised. Mm. He, it's telling us that Abraham had this understanding. He believed that, this, he believed that to honor God, to obey him, and to follow his instruction and the work that he gave us to do was what is acceptable unto God, even before circumcision, by the standard of faith, taking God at his word. When he says it is that he might be the father of all them that believe, believing has nothing to do with physical labor, has nothing to do with it. It's an internal expression. It's an internal. It has to do with our character, our emotion, our heart and mind. There's nothing to do with physical picking up something and chopping a tree down. There's nothing to do with that. Mm -hmm. Nothing. <laughs> it's a result. When you chop a tree down, you know it's going to fall. You don't have to believe it's going to fall. It, you know it's going to fall. So it clearly can't be the same thing. Though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. So it's telling us here by... He might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, though they don't have that straight up experience with the Lord. There are those that live that standard, brothers and sisters. There are those that live in this world right now that live that standard out. They trust so firm in God to provide, yet they haven't been baptized. They are all those people. And those people are being brought into these truths and they are experiencing that there's a reality. And God, it, I think it's easier for God to work with them you know, and to have them experience his truth because they already live the standard. They already live by the standard of faith. If I may say something, yes. James, with um, regards to Romans chapter 9, I keep on jumping the gun. No, it's fine. Go, 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 go. You know, Romans chapter 9 with regards to the seed of Abraham. I like what, uh, what is written here. Romans chapter 9 verses, let's say, 6 onwards here. It says, hang on, let's go to here. In verse 5, who, whose are the fathers and whom, um, as concerning the flesh, Christ came? Who is over, okay, let's start from 6 here. Not as though the word of God has taken none effect, for they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall they, thy seed be called. That is that they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, 
but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. For this is the word of promise. At this time will I come and Sarah shall have a son. So when it says that we're seeds of Abraham, I understand it is that we are Isaac, a type of Isaac. We are representatives of Christ on this earth as Isaac was a representative of Christ. And seen as we're not of the flesh, we're of the promise. And this promise is something that we do not see. Blessed are those that um, do not see me, yet believe in me, you know. So Isaac, when it talks about the seed of Abraham, it is representative of Isaac. You know what I mean? I mean, Isaac had many seeds, but there was a specific seed. There was a, I mean, he had many children, but there was a specific seed that he had, and that was Isaac. So we must be of the promised seed, as Isaac was the promised seed. And we must fulfill that same fulfillment as Isaac had. Yeah, you know, because so Ishmael mean. was his own with his own efforts. Yeah, that was, was his, his, own his own efforts. Yeah, that's right. He, he put it in his own accord. But Isaac was an instruction. That's right. From above. That's right. And that is the comparison as well that's given us. We, yeah. we need to see it in its full context. Yeah. Thank you, brother. Yeah. So um, we continue in verse 11. And that yeah. righteousness might be imputed unto them also. Verse 12. Mm. And the father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, but who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had been yet uncircumcised. Mm -hmm. So this is a standard. It's telling us already, this is the standard that God expects. This is what he expects. He expects us to obey him, whether we are baptized into the truth, not baptized into truth, trying to live our own life. Or not. God is a respect of no man's person. We can do nothing to just say to God, this is what I bring to you, Lord. I hope you accept it. That's not how it works. Mm. If that were the case, then the point of righteousness by Christ is of none effect. It's, it means nothing. You can't have both. You, may, you need to either accept what the Father and the Son's plan is, accept the Son, accept the standard of that Son. Christ didn't labor to do his own work. He didn't have his own home. He didn't even have his own job. He didn't have nothing. He forfeited that in order to do God's work. Mm -hmm. Now, if somebody would say to me, that's extreme. You say, you're telling me that we need to get rid of all, my, all of our stuff? <laughs> well, yes, essentially, yes. At least by, by willpower, at least say, you, you know what? It. I don't want this anymore because it holds me back from being able to stand on God's word. Mm -hmm. God's not going to just, you know, cut it out from you just in day one. But if you're willing to transform your life into that kind of standard of obedience... And in faith, God will take you out of it. He will help you clear the debt, help you sell the house, help you to live a more standard life. Because I can promise you right now, these very things, job, home, car, finance, is going to hold us back from being part of receiving the latter rain experience. Mm -hmm. From those that are going to be called out to go and disciple and make disciples for the Lord. These things are going to hold us back. They're already holding us back. It's one of the reasons why... Brother Bradley and myself have been called to do this work because that was the first thing it had to happen. Yeah. We had to deny ourselves. We are a living standard of this experience. We had to put all things aside and say, Lord, your will, your way, your words, and let my life be an example of what you want it to be. Yeah. Obedience, complete subjugation unto the Lord. Yeah, I, just, I don't think the Lord is entirely saying that get rid of everything as in the sense of you left naked without anything. Because, um, I, but I, th I think the problem with, with us in this world today is that we hold too much value to our material things. And if we need to be in flight, let's say tomorrow they're going to come start persecuting us because of the God that we worship and we need to get up and run. What items will you be taking with you that are of value? You know, take your photo albums, your, your heirlooms, all the things that you hold value to, which is going to weigh you down. And maybe the Lord, in a sense today, maybe James's message is that he's sharing with us today, is that we need to be prepared for this time of trouble that will be upon us. That when we come to this flight, we won't be holding on to these things that will, which will weigh us down. You will just automatically just get up and leave without your attachments to these worlds. It's things. a detachment from the way this world works. Yeah. It's a detachment entirely as our existence that to, we are to conform to the will of God, not our own will anymore. Yeah. And 
it says that when we are called to run, we are not to turn back and get our cloak. Well, that's Elizabeth. Isn't that what she did? Yep. Uh, is it Elizabeth? Solo, uh, Lot's wife? Yes. And she looked behind, she turned to a pillar of salt, and that's the thing. Sodom and Gomorrah, this, this, we're in Sodom and Gomorrah right now. It's going to be burning. Those that are going to return back to be behind are going to be burnt with it or turn to a pillar of salt. So I think the best that we detach ourselves from these worldly things, um, but the Lord obviously, like for me, I've got a car. And without that car, I wouldn't be able to survive. It's, it's given me a means of transport. I mean, we've got things that we need, but, but if the Lord says, get rid of the car tomorrow, we shouldn't have that attachment. We should be say, no hesitation. Yes, Lord, I'll get rid of the car because you told me so. We should have that ability. Yes. So Abraham's righteousness was based on believing the living word of God, which is centered in his son and not on his own works or labors or of righteousness, he, sorry, on righteousness that he performed. He obeyed instruction. And this is the instruction we have to give you. Now, to clarify on faith, I'm going to do what um, we're supposed to do, compare scripture to scripture. Amen. Okay, it's talking about the standard of faith. Let's go to Hebrews 1, uh, sorry, Hebrews 11, verses 1 and 3. Now, we know it, but do we understand it in its truest and fullest meaning? Hebrews 11 Verses 1 to 3. It says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for. Not stuff we have. And evidence of things not seen. That's that same part where you, which you quoted now saying, blessed are those that believe in Christ and do not see him. Mm. Not seen. It's already telling us the standard of the things that are being provided are from a force that is not seen. Everything we do in this life is seen. It's not unseen. We know it can be seen. I can literally build a chair and I can be a carpenter and build furniture and give it to you. It's still seen. It's not unseen. Okay. So this is already giving us a standard that everything that we have is something that God gives. It has nothing to do with us. <clears throat> Verse two. For by it, the elders obtained a good report. Is Abraham not considered an elder? Abraham is. In fact, if you read on from this, from this chapter, verses eight, all the way to 18, it talks about Abraham and Sarah. Mm. So it's giving the example there and many examples in the Bible. But let's go on. Verse three, through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. So by that power, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. So God gives us a word. We don't know. It's sufficient to the days, the evil they are. We're supposed to go one day at a time. I mean, I can, I can testify, yeah, and I'm sure you guys will agree. None of us has ever been able with our own efforts to be able to have dreams, plans, visions moving forward for our lives, and it's ever come out 100%. It never comes out 100%. Mm -hmm. It always comes out 20 or 40 or 60 or whatever, but it's never 100%. God is already setting a standard and a promise right here in the scripture that his way will achieve a 100% result. Mm -hmm. That 100% of result has to do with us Becoming a part of his kingdom, us being able to go to heaven one day and to see him and glorify in him. Our entire existence from when he redeems us from this earth will be complete obedience to his instruction. Mm -hmm. There will be nothing that we can say, this is my effort, this is me. Mm -hmm. Self, self awareness, self understanding has nothing to do with it. We are to conform to the will of God and to know that he has the best way forward. Adam and Eve knew it. If I may say um, in, this, in the book of Psalms, it says, thy word is a lamp unto my feet. Amen. And <clears throat> I, I like that scripture because when you blindly follow the Lord and you allow the Lord to be your pathway, you don't know your destination. But if the Lord just tells you to go left and not right, and you just say, okay, and you follow it. But if you have, and, and, and the Lord's obviously got a plan along the way. But if you, create your own decisions and your own plans. And let's say they work out, like James was saying, how many times they never work out, but let's say they do work out in argument's sake. And 100% it always works out. I, whose glory is it then? Because the plans come from my own carnal mind. Ah, today I wanna go and I'm gonna go work here and do this and do that and everything's working out. And we become like spoiled brats in a sense. Ah, this is all my work. Ah, this is everything I've done. Look what I've done, guys. And I think when we blindly follow the Lord, and just see that little bit of light 
just at, at, at our feet, just enough so we can see where we're going. But we don't exactly know exactly where the pathway that the Lord is leading us. I think we won't be let down. I mean, we won't he be can't let us down. He can't. You know what I mean? We'll only be dis disappointed when you've got these great plans and you keep on trying to get these plans done by your own mind and they never work out. Then you continuously let down. Always. You know, that's called submission. Submission. Amen. Mm. Let's go back to Romans. That's why she says. Yes. That's why she says that we are to, yes, we are to make plans, but we are to surrender, put them before the Lord to be given up or carried out as he sees fit. Now, I would like to uh, read here uh, um, a quote. Um, it says, faith is not the ground of our salvation, but it is the great blessing, the eye that sees, the ear that hears, the feet that run, the hand that grasps. It is the means, not the end. If Christ gave his life to save sinners, why shall I not take that blessing? My faith grasps it, and thus my faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things unseen. Mm. Thus, resting and believing, I have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm. Faith, saving faith, is the act of the soul by which the whole man is given over to the guardianship and control of Jesus Christ. He abides in Christ, and Christ abides in the soul by faith as supreme. The believer commits his soul and body to God, and with assurance may say, Christ is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. All who will do this will be saved unto eternal life. There will be an assurance that the soul is washed in the blood of Christ and clothed with his righteousness, and precious in the sight of Jesus. So if we have this living faith, this saving faith, um, everything that we do is based upon faith in God's power to do whatever it is that we need to do. And it says faith will perfect itself in exercise and activity. So this living faith, this saving faith, is taking hold of God's promises, believing that what he has said he will do just like Abraham had said. So whether we have a job, because Mrs. White talks about that, it's just the full surrender and commitment of ourselves to follow the Lord's leading. She says that God has people who he has blessed to make money with for what? Yeah. The purpose of helping humanity and yeah. fulfilling and helping to supply the wants of the gospel as far as funds go. Amen. And, and, and so I think the work here, yeah, I, I'm going to, I'm agree to a certain extent, but I think the work more she's talking about is, well, people think, well, if I do this, because the Bible tells me to, I'll be saved. If I, eat correctly if i dress correctly if whatever i do i i'm doing it mm. but it's not through the submission of the soul through faith in christ's power to do the work in you yeah. and so we have the works of the flesh we have which is sin but we also have the works of righteousness which we do through the faith just like Abraham did. He fulfilled the commandments of God because he believed in God and he, he committed himself to God yeah. and through the power of his grace lived his life. That's what Jesus did. Yeah. Every morning he spent that hour or however long, how many hours it was in communion with God for what yeah. purpose? To receive strength to receive power, to receive wisdom, and the knowledge and endurance, all these things that he would have that to do the work that God had given him to do. We are to do the same thing, whatever our daily duties are. Exactly. It is not something we give ourselves. It is something that God instructs us to do. 
So indeed, he does give people that have have to have bigger jobs and accumulate fun, and accumulate funds in order to provide for missions and so on. Of course, definitely, I'm not taking anything away from that. It's just we as individuals cannot add to ourselves we anything and suppose it comes from the strength God. of Jesus. We ask for His life. We ask. Well, of course, no doubt. This time. All right. Sorry for the cut and out there. I don't know. Amen. I got that last piece of what you're saying. We, this is exactly what we're discussing here. It's not to take away where God has put us in a position. You know, like uh, Brad was just saying now with Joseph, Joseph was appointed to go through an experience. He, got a, he was a prisoner and then he became a governor. Okay. God is the one that appoints. The point is God is the one that appoints the works that we have to do. And we, as we have been for right. so long, educated into putting ourselves in positions and then supposing that's where God has put us. I'm saying from experience, because this is what happened to me almost all my life. And I realized to myself, this is, I'm putting myself in positions. God's given me skills and so on and so forth. But is this truly what the Lord expects of me at this time? And when I started conforming my life to a way right. that obedience to him, he took me out completely of the life I was in and said, that's not what I actually intended for you. Mm -hmm. This is what I intend for you. I mean, I'll talk from my own experiences that. Could I say so? Okay. So is it, please. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, Brett. No problem. Just, just what made me think, um, um, as Sister Vivian, you know, was talking about um, people, you know, Id you know, with their idols and so forth. What it made me think of is that we, we, and we've told us in the scriptures that we're supposed to be sojourners on this world. We're just travelers traveling through this world, but our, our object, chief object, should be. Um, to do the will of God mm. and um, sorry, I lost my train of thought for a second, um, but to do the will of God and to not be fixed on this world um, and not right. be fixed on our prosperity in this world exactly. because our treasure is in heaven. Yeah, blessed are those that store their treasures in heaven where dust mm -hmm. and moths cannot deteriorate sure. it. Yeah. So Amen. And this is what this this is what this scripture is centered on. It's on this point, and it brings it out beautifully. Anyway, let's let's continue. It says, "For the promise, verse thirteen. For the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith, taking God the righteousness that is attained by trusting in God, by taking Him at His word." Mm. Verse 14, for if they which are of the laws, sorry, for they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void and the promise made of none effect. Yeah. And faith has no place in this. Belief has no place in this whatsoever. And that's what Sister Vivian was saying earlier on. is like some people will say, okay, I'll keep the Sabbath. I'm a vegetarian. I'll, I'll do all these things. Uh, therefore, they, they attribute that to their salvation. Mm -hmm. And what Paul is writing here, he's like saying it's been voided because we should be focusing towards the promise. And that is the righteousness of Christ. Yeah. Okay. I'll give you, I'll give you, I'll give you a very straightforward and radical example. I was a retail manager for a while for a, for a pizzeria company called Roman's Pizza. My life at that time was not conformed to the will of God at all. But I was told my entire life that I had to work. I had to have a job. I had to do something and God will honor me because I'm taking a position in society that is notable and respectful and one that is important. And it shows that I'm productive as a human being. That's not what this scripture is saying. Because had I conformed to the will of God, he would not have me a, a retail manager where I had to work seven days a week, work on the Sabbath, and then completely disregard Sabbath altogether. Mm. Do you see? So this is what we're talking about. This is the works that's being defined and the faith that's being defined here. Are we taking God at his word and him putting us in the position that we need to be? Whether, whether it, whatever it is it needs to be, God is the one that des determines that. We just have to be very careful in what we suppose is God's instruction. This is obviously why, um, why we pray about things and why we put things before the Lord and put mm. our plans before him. Mm. I like... Um... 
I've met many people that do believe in the Sabbath, but they work on the Sabbath. And one of their biggest uh, excuses is, people are their parents, they've got children to feed and bills to pay. And a lot of people justifying, saying, you know, God understands, God understands. And it's, it, it's nice for us to say that to the person, to help the person get off the hook. And we're not saying that you say by the law, we're not putting the law before, the, before that person or before the, um, you know, saying, oh, don't worry, you know, um, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you break the Sabbath, you're going to burn in hell. That's not what, what, we, what, what people should be saying to the person. But really what we should be saying is, where's your faith? Because I know from my own experience and from many other people's experiences that when you, I was a chef and I had to work on the Sabbath and I had to stop working on the Sabbath in 2008. And I had to take another career choice, but the Lord will open doors for you. So I know lots of people that have to pay their bills and they've got to work and stuff like that. But where is their faith at the end of the day? And that's the question. Well, this is how we, this is how it's on this point that you're going to bring up is actually how it summarizes this last verse 15. And when we're done here, we're going to share something that happened on the news that one about the Adventist lady was brought onto the E channel. Yeah, in news and they're discussing her relation to her okay. being working on Sabbath one. I want us to play that because okay. it's very relevant to this topic. Okay. okay. So it says, I'm just going to read from 13 again. It says, For the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void, and the promise made of none effect. Because the law worketh wrath, for where no law is, there is no transgression. Wow. What I'm seeing here is that God is not going to get us to work a work that's going to transgress his law. If there is a work that we can do or that he has put us in a place where it doesn't transgress law, then we are safe. We can, we can clearly see. But look at today's systems. Look at the way that the, the, the corporate industry has been structured. They expect you to work weekends. They expect mm. you to work on the Sabbath. They expect you. There is a transgression of God's law right there. So this is the thing. And it's been a battle for us as Adventists, or those that keep the Sabbath and so mm. on, to stand up and say, I cannot work on the Sabbath. I cannot do that. And, and the, the worst thing we should tell people is, God understands. James, you've got a, you've got a daughter. You've got to feed your, you know, God understands. God does I don't, not understand. I, I, I'm not God. I'm a, who am I to say that God understands for starters? But but God understands. You know, that's, that's, that's the, the worst mentality. Thing. That's and the mentality. I get that all the time from Seven Day Adventists, from my own friend of brothers and sisters. So it's a very dangerous thing. Yeah. Hold that, hold that before, before when you close here, because I want to share the evidence of what's actually going on and how Adventists are actually being brought to the forefront mm -hmm. um, the of, in, into the limelight mm -hmm. as to who we are, what we believe, and how relevant it is to today's day and age. But anyway, let's continue. Verse 16. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace to the end the promise which, which sorry, to the promise might be sure to all the seed that to, that, sorry, let me start again. Therefore, it is of faith, tongue twister, okay, <laughs> that it might be by grace to the end the promise might be sure to all the seed not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. So it's saying it doesn't matter whether you're under the law, under the promise, or under the seed, or under, as long as you're taking God at his word, this is what the promise is made for. This is what he has assured us of. Verse 17, as it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations. Mm -hmm. Okay. He is the father of many nations in the regard of literal seed. He brought about the Israelite nation, brought about Christ, so on and so on. But it also has to do with those that have to do with living the standard of faith. We have become the seed of his nation because we're doing the same thing in the spiritual mm. sense that he did. We're living by the same example mm. that he portrayed back in his time mm. before Christ even was there. Mm. And it's saying to us, it's even, it's even giving those that have not been baptized into Christ, that maybe come to these truths and they come to this understanding and are seeking to be baptized. Even before they are baptized, if they are living by the standard of faith like this, God accepts it because they're not trying to transgress the God's law. They're not trying to break the set. They understand it in principle, but they still want that reunion experience. 
This is a powerful thing. This is a promise made to those that are even in the darker areas of life. This is a great thing. It says, before him, sorry, before him whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead. So obviously talking about the spiritually dead, and calleth those things which be not as they were, as though they were. That's interesting. Verse 18: who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken. So shall thy seed be. Mm. Anyone that would come after, that would believe the way that he believed, that would believe in the word of God, that have that kind of level of faith. They are counted righteous. They are counted righteous in God's eyes. Mm. And being not weak in faith, verse 19, he considered not his own body now dead. He considered it not wasn't worried about his life or his own body when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. This was, he's basically saying it's in, in, in it's regardless of that. Mm. God comes first. Mm. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief that God can't provide something that God is not able for him to have um, things worked out in his life or whatever plans he had moving forward. If I may say in a, in a sign there's a, there's a parallel here to Adam and Eve um, and prophetic understanding that Abraham is representative of like the priest or the high priest of the church and Sarah was representative of, of, of the church and Adam was representative of the high priest and Eve was representative of the church. And the doubt came in through the church because Eve was the one representative of the church when she ate from the fruit it was sarah that had the doubt she was like saying look i'm getting one in years i haven't had a child yet but god said that you shall have a seed so let's fulfill that prophecy here is hagar let's let's fulfill that let's let's give uh, let's have a lady mixed with truth and error who represented as ishmael own efforts her own efforts and that was the church now but the sin only really came in when Abraham, the priest, submitted to that, you know, that dangerous? sin only came into man when Adam submitted to, because when Eve ate the fruit, nothing happened. She's like, wow, this is good. This, you know. But as soon as Adam ate it, they both became naked. The church fell. And this is symbolic of the world today, of our church today, because it's the church that has fallen. And, it's, and, the, and, and we are representative, the, the sons and daughters, we should be representative of priests of this church. And once we fall, or the leaders of the church fall, that is when the, the, the judgment basically will come, I think. I have I think. called you to be separate. Be he separate. Yeah. The remnant what saying. of the seed. Be different from what the way the world is doing, what the way the Laodiceans are doing, the way that the nominal churches are doing, the way the Sunday keeping church, the way that the, everything. Yeah. Break that pattern Be different. that history has been doing throughout time. Yes. So he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was mm. strong in faith, giving glory to God, yeah. not himself, for what he had attained. Yeah. Yes. Vivian. James. So the word staggered, if you look it up, means hesitated not. So he mm. says he hesitated not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, being yeah. fully persuaded that's the faith that we are to have is mm -hmm. that's why it's so impro so important to understand about the promises of god and the conditions and everything that goes along with it and uh and that wow <laughs> this is so powerful if we if we truly understood what that meant is whatever god has promised we can claim those promises if we fulfill the conditions and he will give it to us according to his glory. There are some things that he withholds, but uh, he will answer our prayers. Mm. Amen. Yeah. Amen. I think that that's what's Amen. Being, <laughs> I think that's what's being refined about is because like all have uh, fallen short uh, David made a mistake. Abraham made a mistake. Moses made a mistake. Everybody has made a mistake. As, uh, 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 Elijah made a mistake. But the thing is, when we make these mistakes, we learn from these mistakes. 
So in a sense that when we start to be refined and refined, God puts these, allows these challenges to come in our way. And by these challenges, we first fail, we fail, we fail, but we start to more and rely on God. The more we start to, these challenges come our way. And we, we, then we say, okay, God, you know, I've tried it this way. I've tried it that way. You know what? You take control, you know? And when we finally submit as Abraham, as David, as Elijah, as all of them, that is when our faith really starts to come into fruition. And I think that's the refinement process. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Awesome. Right. And so when I was saying that, you know, God doesn't always answer our prayers the way that we want them to be, well, I didn't say it like that in particular, but uh, spiritually, he will answer all of those prayers. What I was referring to that he, we may not get the answer we want is when it comes to asking for needs or um, he will supply all our needs according to his riches and glory. And that's a promise. And, and so when we submit our needs to him, we are to believe that they will be supplied and that they are being supplied. But whatever we are praying for, we know and believe that at the time that it that we really need it it will be supplied and so when we ask for something in faith believing that he will answer we are to look at it like he's already given us the gift amen yeah. amen that's it he's our father that is it he will not let us go hungry and he has nailed it on the head <laughs> <laughs> thank you sister all right let's end here it says yeah Verse 21, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. And therefore, it was imputed to him for righteousness. So it's, it's a condition. If he indeed was strong in faith and believed the promise that was made and that God was able to perform, it was counted for him as righteousness. Mm -hmm. Only by that standard is righteousness understood and attained. Now, verse 23, now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him. But for us mm. also, woo -woo, victory. <laughs> it's telling us imme immediately, this is for us, to whom it shall be imputed. If we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. And who's him? Oh, That's God. the father. That's yeah. the father. You see, once again, the father's taking an active role here. It's not mm. just through his son. Verse 25, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. So this is the standard that justifies us in the eyes of the father. This is the standard that he gave us through his son. And he gave those, he typified those points through the ages with Abraham mm -hmm. and with Elijah. Yes, they fail, mm -hmm. but they, their faith was renewed to such an extent. Mm -hmm. They were like, they were essentially like mini messiahs for those people at that mm -hmm. time. That's mm -hmm. what they represented. And it gives us hope. That's why he says, be the light bearers of the world. Yeah. We are to be, we are to have that same kind of belief, that same kind of strength in living standard to, to share with others. Mm -hmm. And they will see it and they will love it. Yeah. Last scripture I want to just share in here comes from 1 Corinthians 2, verses 14. 1 Corinthians 2 and verses 14. And this is powerful. In fact, read the whole thing, but I was reading this and the Lord said, I want you to go to 1 Corinthians 2 verse 14 to end off the study. And when I read it, it was like, my mind just exploded. And I was like, thank you, Lord. That makes so much more sense now. It says, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. I'm going to read that again. But the natural man, ourselves self what i think is right what i think will, will be acceptable to god receiveth not the things of the spirit of god so it's telling us god cannot give us his truths if we have that mindset if we have that kind of thinking we are not going to attain the things from god for they are foolishness unto him these things are foolishness unto god he doesn't care about what we think that's why he says i want to respect of any man's person he doesn't he loves us but he doesn't care because we are simple beings for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them. Neither can we know what that means. Why? Because they are spiritually discerned. 
And we can only be spiritually discerning things when we are following in the footsteps of Christ. Mm -hmm. We are taking the faith just like Abraham had and saying, God, your will, your way, your words. You tell me what to do this day and I shall follow. So that's the study for today. I hope it's been a blessing for all. I We can uh, continue on with this discussion. There's a lot to discuss around this point. I think, <laughs> I think a lot of people of the world, when they look at Christians and um, a Christian who's got strong in faith, because they're not spiritually discerned, like, you know, the Lord wakes you up, let's say the vaccine, and you, tell, you go around telling people, stay away from the vaccines. Eh? And they tell you, are you a conspiracy theorist? Mm-hmm. Are you crazy? You know, I mean, half the planet has taken the vaccine. What's wrong with you? You know, I'm just using that as a poor example. But, but this is the, the walk as a Christian that the people that are not spiritually discerned are usually on the popular arena. They're more popular, or so-called popular in the world and we are peculiar people so when we tell people certain things like you know this and this and that about the word jesus died for you and they don't understand they just will never understand no matter how you try and tell them amen yeah this is true brother this is a thing would you like to just close with prayer close on prayer for us just to end the session so i can stop the recording and then we can continue discussing this because this is very important this is very important discussion thank you brother all right. Heavenly Father, we thank Thee, O gracious God, that You've placed each and every one of us on a pathway, and You've allowed these obstacles to come, come upon our pathway, Father God, because it's not because You don't like us or You want to punish us. It's because You're refining us. Just like Abraham, just like Elijah, just like David, we have all fallen short, Father God. But Father God, through this journey in our lives, As we walk this pathway, we've allowed ourselves to rely more on you, to give ourselves faith unto you, O Father. And we give ourselves as a submission to your power, because we know that power is the only thing that light unto our feet, that light in our pathway. We know that Jesus Christ has died for our sins, and that is why we're all here, Father God. That is why you've united us together in unity, is through the blood of the Lamb that has purified us as we go along this journey. Because your grace, Father God, is forgiving. And you have forgiven each and every one of us, no matter what we have done wrong. But because we know by faith you have forgiven us. Just like Abraham, Father God, he has given all of his life unto you. He walked that pathway as a blind faith, as we all should do, and offer his son as a sacrifice as we should offer ourselves as a sacrifice on a daily basis. May we understand the Bible in its clarity as we walk this journey, Father God. May we be grateful and thankful that you have given us this light. We thank you and please be with us as we go throughout the rest of our day. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. Thank you, you, brother. Amen.